to ask RJ to come up, please. I thought we were supposed to be anonymous. <clears throat> so uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I want to introduce this very, very pretty uh, rock. So this rock, as you know, is about 4.6 billion years old. Um, depending, uh, there's a new paper out seemingly every week that is pushing this next part of the timeline back, but at least 3.6 billion years ago, uh, the lithic processes of this rock created, began to create the biosphere. The paper out last week says maybe 4.2 billion uh, years ago, but I think the, the real data on that is weak. Um, <laughs> but either way, it's a long time. And this biosphere has continued to proliferate. You know, sometimes I like to think about what this planet has looked like over a timeline if we were just watching it from the moon. And you know, what's happened is it's becoming increasingly covered in muck. It was a very, it was a rocky planet and we're, we are part of that muck, right? So, so this um, process of uh, proliferation of the biosphere got going and it's really pr produced a lot of a lot of diversity. I just want to move to the diversity first. Um, beautiful pictures, and these are you know, just a very tiny, very tiny sample. Uh, but the thing to bear in mind about the diversity, of course, is that <clears throat> it's all running on the same software language. And so as everyone here knows, I think, this is a software language that is written in a base four code. Uh, here is depicted, of course, the ploiety varies, but here it's depicted as a diploid, which is what our genomes happen to be. Um, so this software code uh, is, I want to go back to this diversity. So this diversity, because we're in the middle of it, right, actually looks maybe greater than it is, because it must be borne in mind that the homology between man and banana is 50%. And for some of us, maybe more. <laughs> so now I want to go back to this one, this one, because I want to make a point. This proliferation of the biosphere has been so great that there are, there's actually some pretty good, uh, some of you may have seen the paper, some, actually I think the first really good uh, statistically based estimate of the number of eukaryotic species on this planet, it's 8.7 million. Uh, plus or minus 1.2 million. Um, the number of organisms on this planet probably exceeds the number of stars in the universe. So I think we maybe for the first time can, of course every generation tries to map the world to its own taxonomy and we're no different, but this is my favorite. I think we know what the world is now. It's a supercomputer. What is DNA, right? I, I'm sure there are some IT geeks here. You know, if I were to ask any IT person, what is a material that encodes data, uh, it will last forever as long as you don't do, you know, some severe damage to it, right? Pour acid on it, expose it to radiation, or subject it to shear force. Theoretically, it will last forever. They would tell you that's memory. So if you think about the number of organisms on this planet, probably exceeding the number of stars in the universe. And you think about eight point, that's quite an install base for you IT folks, right? 8.7 million different models of devices just in the eukaryote, among the eukaryotes alone, probably the prokaryotes is 10 times that. That means that the Earth is a supercomputer. I mean, a vast supercomputer. And that means that this conference and this conversation we're having right now equals processing. So every supercomputer needs an engineer. It needs tech support, right? <clears throat> so I don't know how many of you here remember the whole Dobler and Wilson. I wish I had a timer to look at so I don't run out of time because <laughs> I'm digressing. Um, do you remember those, those beautiful books on ants that Edward O. Wilson and Holdobler, you know, produced like for decades. <laughs> um, 
And they were always so much fun to read because the secret invitation was to look at these use, you know, I've never had that much interest in mermology, right? But you could look at what they're talking about and you could speculate about our own eusocial species uh, and even more broadly about the eusocial biosphere because clearly the organisms within the biosphere are much uh, more closely related and, uh, and more networked uh, than we previously appreciated. Look, 90% of the cells in our body aren't even human to begin with. So, uh, if you think about this vast network that occurs in this vast supercomputer, so the picture that I'm, I'm omitting here is the one that is that way and here, right? It's, it's the only one of these 8.7 million species that actually went to work to engineer the biosphere. And we've been doing it for a long time. Well, not in terms, not in long in cosmologic terms, uh, but we've been doing it for the last little while, meaning say 12,000 years or so. And it, starting about 12,000 years ago, uh, we began engineering the biosphere around us. Uh, I contend <clears throat> that the agricultural revolution occurred in Mesoamerica at about the same time as it occurred in the, uh, in the Fertile Crescent uh, and in China, so between 10 and 15,000 years ago, always pertaining to cereal grains. That's actually what enabled what we refer to as civilization. So it actually enabled our species to move from being, being a nomadic hunter-gatherer species to being able to invest in all the things, including science, you know, uh, arts and... Um, you know, cities and states and philosophies and religions. And it really bought us our first, uh, our first liberty to invest in these kinds of pursuits that, like human longevity, <laughs> that, we're, that we're invested in today. And man, we did invest in human longevity. So we've really done a pretty good job. I mean, if, 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 if our species had actually, uh, if June of you know, your ancestor of 12,000 years ago had you know, convened a conference on this topic, then the sequelae have been magnificent because the, the effect is measurable you know, in the billions of tons of biomass. So if this is, you see, this actually does track 12,000 years. It's scary to see cattle at like a billion tons of biomass. <laughs> it's, it's an absolutely phenomenal number. Uh, these are all organisms that, <clears throat> as you saw from the previous slide, uh, these are organisms that we have substantially engineered. So the rules of genetic engineering, and by the way, that's exactly what occurred. So you should know, and we should all recognize, that the first genuinely industrial technology of man was genetic engineering. We've been doing it for 12,000 years. Cows, pigs, horses, tomatoes, corn, uh, all the things that, uh, that the most she-she, non-GMO restaurant in San Francisco serves you uh, have all been engineered, okay? None of them are natural. Uh, that's what a potato looks like, all right? The one on the right-hand side, okay? This is teosinte. This is the one that before man started engineering it. If you saw it growing in your garden, you would think it was a weed, right? This is what we like, right? And this is the product of thousands of years of genetic engineering. The rules of the genetic engineering have been for the last 12,000 years that anything that we could have get, anything that we could induce to have molecular sex with anything else would be perfect because it's natural. Even after we started supplying radiation to these, to these gametes in order to accelerate, the, in, increase the mutations in order to accelerate the, so direct, the directed evolutionary process, we considered that to be natural too, which is a bit constrained if you think about it because in order to get that crazy woolly sheep there, right? I mean, can you imagine the number of crosses that had to have been done in order to obtain that thing it was being bred in, through directed evolution for this sole purpose, but every time a homologous recombination occurred, millions of other events occurred. They did not have the technology to know what those were, and they never cared. 
So if you examine that sheep and you, want, you ask, gee, but uh, is that wool more hyperallergenic uh, than another sheep's wool? The answer is, we don't know. Uh, would the meat of this lamb be more carcinogenic than the meat of another lamb? No idea. And yet, natural. Okay? And completely unexamined in terms of biosafety risk. So today, we have techniques in molecular biology for both reading and writing uh, DNA very, very well. We become extremely adept at reading it, as you see from the blue graph. And we're getting better at writing it. There are people here who are representatives of a company that, have, uh, that are in the process of bringing those lines down by uh, one, one and three quarters of those bars. Um, so down to, uh, let's say, to the negative third in the near future. So we're doing pretty well. And as these tools became available, we found that it was possible for us to first you know, elucidate the genome, really know the genome that we wanted to work with. And then instead of just doing homologous recombinations, generation after generation, just trying to find one trait and ignoring everything else, we could actually surgically make tiny changes. And with these tiny changes, we could um, like five minutes. Okay, I'll go fast. These tiny changes, we could then test those as independent as independent conditions, right? Uh, so we actually made the genetic engineering that we've been doing for twelve thousand years much much safer, much more scientific, uh, much more testable, and yet the reaction has been something like this. Now you could be a curmudgeon uh, about this. However, I gave a talk a few months ago, I think June seen it, which is maybe one reason why he invited me, uh, on the topic of technophobia, so I'm not going to cover technophobia here. I would just ask you to realize that technophobia is actually very, very uh, broadly conserved in our society. It's actually a healthy adaptation. The truth is we're all technophobic. We've always been technophobic, okay? So no reason to be a curmudgeon <laughs> about it, right? And in fact, every technology has induced, that I can think of, every disruptive technology has induced technophobia early on, beginning with fire. There is a reason that in every classical pantheon of gods, our firebringer is derided by his peers as a troublemaker. Loki, Apollo, on and on, okay? Money, right? Uh, this was a foreign imposed technology at the time of Jesus. Money is the root of all evil. Render under Caesar what is Caesar's. And by the way, this peacenik Jesus beat the hell out of those money lenders, right, physically, right? No turning the other cheek in that, on that day. Well, it's because, <laughs> it's because money was a scary technology. It was a disruptive, disruptive technology. So in a barter-based economy, right, Suddenly, the Romans are imposing this regime, and it's upsetting the area. So you can, all right, factories. We know about the Luddites, right? Steamships. This is an amazing technology. You know, I, I'm, just, uh, I'm just amazed that people weren't more phobic about the steam engine. In America, through most of the latter half of the 19th century, the number of people who died from steam engine explosions on just the river craft was 2,000 per year. And yet, the technology just took off. The automobile. Then Governor Woodrow Wilson, later President of the United States and famous peacenik, League of Nations, etc., cetera, um, bragged publicly that when equestrians were shooting their pistols at these horrible people in these automobiles who were flaunting their wealth and scaring the horses, that his sympathies were with the equestrians. He later learned to drive a car. Okay. Computers, go on YouTube. Skip my YouTube. This one's fascinating. 1981, a young Steve Jobs is on Ted Koppel's Nightline, being interviewed by Ted Koppel, right, saying, I think that we, every, everybody in the world will have a computer. We'll have a personal computer. It'll be awesome. So many benefits. Ted Koppel had this other, some academic on there to express the phobic view about this, about how horrible this will be for society, about like, it's an unregulated thing. Clearly, the government should play a very large role, et cetera, et cetera. And cell phones, by the way, we all know this is actually true. Uh, your use of these things does relate you know, directly to the incidence of glial cancer. So 
every, <laughs> we've been phobic about everything. So I'm gonna give a few examples that I, in my remaining five seconds, <laughs> one, one minute, <laughs> all right. Um, we know that technology wins out. We know that a technology does get adopted despite technophobia. Why, do, why is it? Number one, it's because uh, once consumers actually grasp that the benefit exceeds the cost, right, the, or the risk, they actually want that benefit, they want that cell phone, look, the cell phone. This is the most rapidly adopted technology in the history of the world, okay? Um, and there are a lot of things wrong with it, by the way. You know, any local hacker who knows my cell, you know, my cell number could read my emails. Right? We all know these kinds of risks, and yet we find the benefit outweighs the cost. Okay? I'll go fast. These are some examples that I'm involved with in which what we're doing is engineering biology to great effect. Um, I, won't, I won't burden you with uh, another description. I just want to get to my concluding point, which is back to this pretty rock. I showed you some pretty pictures that come from this rock, but what I didn't show you are the pictures of a dying cancer patient or uh, an environmental catastrophe, um, or people starving to death. And so what I really want you to realize is, while well, I was joking about man having this role as tech support, really having a destiny as being the engineer on this planet, I want to encourage you to think that it's not optional. We have to engineer this planet. We've begun. The graph I showed you a few moments ago shows you that we've been doing it anyway, and we have tremendously altered this planet. So it's not, a matter, it's not an ethical issue for us to discuss. It's like we're thinking about starting. We've done it. Okay? The question is, when are we going to accept responsibility end-to-end -end for this process? When are we going to really take, res <laughs> take responsibility for our actions um, and really engineer the planet, take on this responsibility, because it's our job anyway. So whether you believe in destiny or not, maybe it was just, you know, whatever, fate or luck or uh, coincidence, we are that species, we have been that species for at least 12,000 years. Uh, there's really no going back. And so we shouldn't pretend about it, we should get serious about it, and we should be responsible about it. Thanks very much. If we actually manage to solve longevity, we won't have to cut all these amazing talks short. So thank you very much, RJ. Those of you who came in late, um, we're doing introductions after the talk so that we can all be very open-minded about what people have to say. So RJ Kirk, believe it or not, is an attorney. Now, he happens to also have founded uh, several biotech companies that he sold in the billions. So he's a very successful uh, biotech entrepreneur. He's also um, very imaginative about uh, the fact that we can reprogram human biology and also the ecosystem and businesses and that we can hack a lot more things um, and then just what we're doing up there. So that's RJ Kirk.